there are actually many equivalent definitions for what it means for a subset of Euclidean space to be a manifold. Another one that we'll use frequently is the following, which seems a little bit uh, weaker than the definition of a manifold, but it's, they're actually equivalent. So a subset M in some Euclidean space R K is a manifold if and only if the following conditions hold. There exist for every point, so we start off the same way. We want to somehow describe what it means to be locally Euclidean, but the details are in what exactly we mean to be locally Euclidean. So if and only if for all points C and M, there exists open set, an open set U in RK and an open set W, but this time W, and by the way, a subset is an M-dimensional manifold, I should say. If and only if I have a W in some R M, both of these are open. Together with a function alpha from W to RK. satisfying the following conditions. First of all, U has to be an open neighborhood of C. So C is in U. And we also ask that alpha of W actually equals U intersected with the manifold. U intersect M. And also, the following three very important conditions. First, alpha is, let's say, differentiable. Or we can replace differentiable. What I mean by differentiable, I mean of class CR, for instance. Is differentiable and one to one. And here's a very, uh, maybe somewhat surprising condition. Where is this coming from? The, so associated to every point y in w, it makes sense to look at the differential of alpha at that point y. So we demand that this as a linear transformation from Rm to Rk has rank k. And what this means is that all of its vectors get sent to, uh, for instance, a basis of vectors gets sent to a linearly independent set. Sorry, has rank M. Sorry, has rank M. And finally, alpha inverse, which is a function from U intersect M to W is continuous. The reason this, uh, sorry, this isn't a definition. This is another definition, but it's, it's also a theorem given the fact that we've already defined what we mean by a manifold. The surprising thing here is that we only seem to demand that the inverse function is continuous. And uh, it's a theorem that, of course, it, it's somewhat obvious that um, a subset is a manifold implies this definition because we can actually construct an inverse that's of class CR. Um, what's not so obvious is that uh, all we need is continuous and the CR comes from the fact that uh, these other conditions are satisfied. What goes wrong with the definition if any of these fail? So that's what we're going to focus on right now. So let's look at some examples, or rather non-examples. And let's look at the first one. So the first one is going to look like it shouldn't be a manifold, but the question is why. So let's look at the following. 
subset of R2, let's take the graph of a function, and let's say our function f, so it's a function of a single variable, and it's given by the absolute value of x. So that looks something like this, the graph of this function. And why is this not a manifold? Well, first of all, we know where the issue could possibly be. The potential issue is exactly at the point 0, 0. That's where we see there's sort of a cusp at that point. If we were to take our alpha to be this f, we see the, a problem immediately. And the first problem we see is that this alpha is not differentiable at 0, 0. And furthermore, as a result, its rank isn't even defined. So this, this is just a terrible situation where almost no conditions hold. However, we could somewhat try to remedy this because really what we're looking at is this particular subset. Just because we describe this subset as the graph of a function doesn't, and that function isn't, um, doesn't satisfy these conditions does not imply that it's not a submanifold. For instance, just consider the parabola, x squared. If I did that, that is a submanifold, even though alpha it is differentiable. Um, it does not have rank m because it's 0. The differential is 0. But we can find an open set around every point and construct such an alpha that satisfies these conditions. It turns out for this example, we can't. And let's try to illustrate this by constructing a differentiable alpha um, that almost satisfies a lot of these conditions, but does not satisfy the one in the middle, for instance. So I can also rewrite this, describe this subset. Let's call this, um, since it's not a manifold, let's call it S or something. Describe S as the image of the following function. Let's try this t, let's take t cubed, and the absolute value of t cubed. You might think, oh, this function doesn't look differentiable because of the absolute value sign, but that wouldn't quite be a correct assessment because we know that if we recall a fact that says if we have any function f of x that satisfies the condition that its absolute value is less than or equal to x squared, then f is differentiable at 0. So we might think that maybe this function is not differentiable at 0, but that's actually false. It is differentiable, so it satisfies this condition. Furthermore, it is 1 to 1. I'll let you think about why that's the case. And in fact, the inverse is also continuous. However, the situation that goes wrong with this function is that the derivative of alpha at 0 of alpha at 0 has rank 0 and its requirement is that it have rank 1 now of course again this isn't a proof that shows that this subset is not a manifold it just shows that for our particular choice of alpha we weren't able to construct an alpha that satisfies these three conditions. But it is a fact that there does not exist an alpha that satisfies all these three conditions. And I'll leave that for you as an exercise. Another non-example, so that, that point illustrates the fact, that, well the first part illustrates that what could go wrong if this fails. This also, this second example actually also illustrates what could go wrong if this condition fails. What about this condition? Both of these examples um, actually made, well, this example made sense if uh, the inverse was still continuous. So an example where alpha inverse is not continuous, you can look at the following subset of R2. Looks like a, uh, a figure eight. And it's given by a function from zero to pi to um, R2, let's call that alpha, and alpha of t, it actually has a rather complicated formula. Um, a part of me doesn't want to actually write that one down, but I will just for completeness. It's given by sine 
2t, absolute value of cosine t, sine 2t, sine of t. So this function actually traces out the following curve. It starts very close to the origin because we don't include 0. So it starts very, very close to the origin. It comes out along this way, goes down through the origin this time, comes back up, and then it asymptotically approaches the origin again from this side as it approaches pi. So this function, if I look at it, it actually satisfies the first two conditions. It is differentiable everywhere. You can actually check, um, check that. It might not be so obvious because of the absolute value sign here, but it's still true. And that's because, um, well, I'll let you think about why. And it also has rank 1 everywhere as well. The condition that fails is that alpha inverse is not continuous. And to sort of briefly see this, if we chose an open neighborhood around the point 0, 0, and we looked at what the image of that open set is under the map alpha inverse, which is defined because this is a one-to-one -one function. We never repeat at 0 because it only asymptotically approaches 0 as we go to these two endpoints, but it only hits 0 exactly at pi over 2. So we have this function alpha, and if we look at um, alpha inverse, then we can look at what happens to the open neighborhood around the origin. And the open neighborhood splits into three different parts. The open neighborhood covers a little region around the point pi over 2, and it also covers regions about the point 0 and pi. So if I choose this open neighborhood to be small enough, I can make it so that these are actually um, non-intersecting open sets. And in order for alpha to be continuous, I know that it would have to send, for any neighborhood in here, I can find a small enough neighborhood here so that it gets mapped into it. But I already see a problem. If I choose an open neighborhood around pi over 2, no matter how small I pick this region, I will always have part of that open set hitting these two endpoints. So I won't be able to find such a small enough open set, and therefore, by definition, that function can't possibly be continuous. And this agrees with our intuition that this shouldn't be a manifold because if we look at this closely, we should see, well, locally it doesn't look like an ordinary line. It looks sort of like an X. And that doesn't look like a one-dimensional object. It sort of looks like you know, one-dimensional objects attached to each other in some awkward way. Um, of course, we can make a definition that includes those as examples as well, but that wouldn't be the standard definition for what it means for that subset to be a manifold.